Good morning, everybody. This year in uh, NYU Florence, we've been doing a lot of programming throughout the year on 1968, since it's the 50th anniversary of 1968, a period in which there was another election, which was about kind of anti-establishmentarianism, um, coalitions in, uh, which were challenging institutions of power and privilege. On the left, it was about eliminating racial discrimination and the rise of the military industrial complex. Students were mobilizing against the war. Now our students, even this morning I had a conversation with one, are mobilizing for the environment and against guns, and sadly still protesting racial inequality. But f we have assembled our usual distinguished group of experts and practitioners to, re to review the results of the midterm elections. And we do so as a kind of activism, a way to engage students in the debate, to give them the tools and the knowledge with which, um, with any luck, to inspire them to become involved. And in truth, at this moment, it's a little hard to make the case that politics is a career they should enter because there's no apparent, this is my editorializing, no apparent shared sense of purpose. No purpose, it seems, to them but to prevail. But I am certain that in this room this morning, as in prior years, there is a shared sense of purpose evident. With experts and opinion leaders we have assembled who have implicitly and explicitly developed um, a shared sense of rules of engagement. Though everybody here has fought and fought hard for their point of view, to defend a point of view, they've not done so at the expense of civility because of a shared sense of purpose to defend, to protect, to secure the democratic principles on which our country, not this one, but in America, was built. And that shared sense of purpose is evident, and I. Maybe it's the hills of Toscana. Maybe it's the villa on the hill away from the cares of the city. Maybe it's the beauty of where we are. But my sense, my money, is on the fact that this group of men and women have understood the importance of this task and have committed themselves to integrity. Let's hope it's contagious. That brings me to my moments of gratitude, first and foremost and always to Bob Schrum who's not here, but is always with us implicitly. It was with Bob that we began this series, I don't even know how many years ago anymore, maybe 12 years ago. So thank you, Bob, if you're listening or if you're ever watching. To Steve McMahon, his worthy successor and my great friend and collaborator in putting these together over so many years, obviously it would be completely impossible and nowhere near as fun without you. To Lynn Brown up here in the first row, <laughs> my uh, my colleague at NYU, who has, through the Bradamus Center and through her vice presidency, always supported and enjoyed um, this convening. So I thank you, and of course to the tireless Tom McIntyre. There he is again, back there in the back, who never wants to speak, but I keep imploring him to. Um, offer comments, but he's, he's delegated that to me, and, but um, thank you, Tom. And to the amazing team at La Pietra Dialogues, Lucia Ferroni, stand up and receive applause. <laughs> Maria Mihailovic, who's absent from the room, but maybe we can bring her back in. <laughs> Megan Matters. And Ali, this year, Alice Consigli, who's up there. <laughs> Every year we take one, um, we hire one fellow from the Italian university system, usually a graduate, postgraduate in political science, and Alice is our student this year. And of course, to each and every one of the participants, who over the years we've done amazing work together, but also to their wonderful spouses who are equally 
expert and important contributors to the success of these events. So I'd like to recognize them by name. Cynthia Axney, somewhere here in the room. There she is, drinking her coffee. <laughs> Jackie Madden, maybe not here. Nick Schmidt, Susan Collins, I can't see. Joe McLean, <laughs> and Andrea Steele. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to all of the people who have put in such hard work to make this a success. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ellen, and um, thank you very much for uh, being at least a host for me for the last three conferences and your generosity of everyone here. Uh, so this panel is about the midterms and a, a recap, which we will do very briefly, and then spend more time on talking about what's next. Um, the panelists, you see their names, their brief bios are here on the, uh, in, your, in your packet, so I'm not going to spend any time on going down and introducing, because I want to spend more time discussing um, what happened and what's coming next. And I want to start at this end of the table with Todd Harris. The, the opening question is going to be for everyone to just give one lesson that they came away with from the midterm elections. Uh, either from the results or the way the campaigns were run or um, President Trump's closing arguments, however you want to define it. Uh, Todd, sorry. Um, good morning, everyone, and I'll just echo uh, my gratitude for once again being uh, included here in Florence. Um, one lesson. It, I would say one, I don't know if this is the most important important one, but certainly one that um, in, uh, I did races all over the country, and one of the things that we found, uh, it didn't matter whether you were running for Senate, uh, governor, or, you know, local Supreme Court judge, um, the, uh, the old adage that all politics is local um, is either it completely uh, inoperable or on its way to becoming inoperable. Um, in, the, in the 94 midterms, only about a third of all voters said that they were basing their vote as either a sign of um, uh, support or opposition to, to President Clinton. Uh, that number this last cycle was closer to 75% of all voters said that, that they were basing their votes either in support of or opposition to President Trump. Um, it, the idea that, that you can have a narrative that exists uh, in a silo uh, separate from that, the national conversation um, uh, is, um, it, it's a bit of a fool's errand. So I would say that. That was a big one. <laughs> Chairman Steele. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, I'm a newbie. <laughs> I'm not a newbie at too many things, but I'm a newbie here for, the, uh, for this conversation. Um, and so thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to be a part of this. Um, when, in going into this election, um, as someone who uh, had a direct hand in amassing the victories of 2010, um, it, it kind of harkened back for me uh, the questions that um, I formulated along with my team at that time, uh, since what you saw on the ground uh, in 2018 was very different from what you saw in 2010. And the questions at that time revolved around policy, and personalities, and, and, and things like that. Well, in this election, what, what I concluded was there wasn't that much policy being talked about when you stopped and thought about it. I mean, Republicans had this enormously uh, strong argument to make about the economy, the tax cuts, the Supreme Court justices, and the list of things that they were doing on the regulatory side. You know, granted, partisans would agree or disagree um, on those efforts, but still, in terms of where the voting, certainly the base, 
and certainly a broader community, a cross-section of voters were, they kind of liked what was going on. I mean, it's reflected in the polls, even though you kind of got this weird kind of, yes, um, you know, the economy is going strong, but the country's on the wrong track. Which led to the second part. How they got to that was the personality. A lot of this election was revolved around the personality of the president. But for me, uh, I drilled it down a little bit further than that and asked two questions going into uh, the election night, which I wanted to see if the country would start to answer. The first was, what kind of country do you want? And the second was, what kind of country, uh, what kind of leaders do you want to lead that country? And I think in many respects, um, and I think very much to what you were saying, Todd, voters started to answer that question, or starting to answer that question, both of those questions. Uh, and so now, uh, when we look at some of these races where the expectations were, for example, um, that Gillum was going to walk away in Florida, or, or Stacey Abrams was going to walk away in Georgia, um, you know, that's a very local race compared to running for the U.S. Senate, for example, or, or running for Congress, which is a federal race. Um, voters kind of came back with a bifurcated answer. And, and I think it's something that, I guess my takeaway is that I see voters entering more in a, in a transition right now, where they don't, like, they don't like a lot of the crazy that's coming out of Trump land, uh, but, they, but they're conflicted by how they feel about how things are going in the country overall. And so they see a good economy, um, they see things um, improving in certain sectors, and the question of personality or policy uh, really is going to see, be played out, I think, over the next um, cycle in terms of how voters come down, whether the personality is too much or the policy trumps uh, that in some form. Great. Joel Benison. Um, you know, having been engaged in these elections and these conferences over the last decade or so um, in, in a, a different way, I think the transformation we saw in 2008 with uh, the way the Obama campaign organized and engaged voters, sustained it over a period of time. Um, I think the lesson I take away from this election, when you look at the results among voters, particularly under the age of 40, but even voters under the age of 65, we're living in an age of permanent engagement. The media transformation that's taking place can be very disruptive and very divisive, um, can be overcome uh, in campaigns. If you don't treat people like voters, you're going to talk to you know, every two years. Instead, you talk to them every day. You've got the means to do it now. And I think a lot of the energy that we saw on the Democratic side and the turnout we saw on the Democratic side and the places and the kinds of districts that we won in in the House of Representatives are the result of a more continual conversation. And I think those who succeed in politics, I think, Todd, whether it's local or national, because I agree with you largely about that, because we're I don't know that we actually have a national conversation, but there's certainly a national ecosystem taking place. You've got to be attentive to that, but I think you cannot expect that you can animate and activate your voters for the last you know, four, six months of a campaign. You've got to stay with them. You've got to keep in touch with them. I think on the other level, you know, we can, we can debate as we go through the panels this week on some of the issues, but when you look at the exit polls, and I've always believed this as a, as a consultant, that elections are about their lives, not your life. And you can talk about all the macroeconomic numbers that people think are good, but when you look at what voters said about their lives, including on the economy and the tax cuts, the majority of voters, and a sizable majority, almost two-thirds, didn't think they were better off than they were two years ago. They didn't think the tax cuts were helping them uh, that passed when you look at the exit polls. So I think that you know, the notion of a national conversation, it's so much harder to have today because of a fractured media environment, but you have to keep in touch with people in their lives and how they are thinking about these things. I think all of us on these panels have agreed in a long time, Democrats and Republicans, that Washington can be a deadening place. And so I think while all politics may not be local, I think being really in touch with people and finding the ways to be in touch with where they're at uh, will become a greater imperative for our campaigns and for our politics going forward because Washington 
dare I say, is so out of touch with America right now. I don't know how we get around it. Stephanie Cutter. Well, um, I want to echo uh, my colleagues up here and say thank you very much for having um, us back again. Um, I think this is my fourth or fifth time doing this panel, and I was just thinking back to what we were talking about two years ago at this time. <laughs> uh, and a lot of us had our heads in our hands wondering what the hell happened. Um, so I look back um, at our most recent election results compared to what we were talking about in 2016 and a couple of lessons that I take. First of all, I agree very much with Joel that the way to win uh, is to have that constant conversation and be in those communities. If you look at where we did win, um, it's a result of uh, really the, after the Trump um, election, people taking it into their own hands locally and not waiting for the statewide party or the national party to come in and organize a district, but it was really women deciding to organize and building an organization outside of the party in these districts, particularly in Virginia and Pennsylvania where women won big. Um, and it was that conversation that started the day after President Trump was elected all the way through election day um, last week that brought those districts um, to the Democratic side. The second lesson, I know I'm not supposed to do two, but I was, Joel gave me the first idea, so I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second lesson was, you know, we, a lot of what we talked about in 2016 is, are the big losses that Democrats uh, incurred uh, amongst um, exurban rural voters, particularly white voters, particularly white men. And if you look at 2018, did we make any gains there? We made some gains. I mean, we, uh, we got the statewide governor's office in Wisconsin. Uh, we won in Pennsylvania. We won big in Michigan. And certainly the diversity of that uh, vote mattered. Um, but we did win some of those white voters and white men particularly back. Um, however, there is still, for Democrats, our coalition is diverse. Um, in many ways, it's young. Uh, we won. Uh, we won the total vote. I think, and Joel, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 49 and below. Yes. Um, uh, but there is still a divide. If you look at Iowa, you know where Joel and I were involved in both 08 and 2012 with President Obama. He won 55 of those districts, or no, 29 of 55 of those Iowa counties. And Hubble, uh, who was running for governor, only won 11. And Hillary Clinton did worse than that. And Hubble improved on her margins. Um, but that says to me that we still have a lot of work to do to appeal to those voters. And, um, and part of what, uh, actually, what everybody has talked about so far, um, the reason we didn't win those counties is complicated. It's both part of a national message. Trump did a very good job nationalizing this election so that his base would turn out. That's something that President Obama was never able to do and actually we were told not to do. Um, and uh, second, um, the, the people on the ballot in Iowa were very successful in localizing those races. So it was, a, it was complicated. It's, it was a combination of people turning out for Trump, but then also people turning out based on local issues. So that's something that we need to pay attention to, given the way our system is structured and the electoral college and um, how you have to build a 270, of how you create a more diverse coalition that doesn't exclude white men. No offense to white men. Rob Collins. Hello. Um, uh, thank you for having me. This is great. And, and a credit to the university um, and a credit to the organizers that um, you can uh, get such uh, really uh, talented people to come. I learn every year when I come to this, and um, um, and uh, I think uh, more of these are better rather than less. So thank you for for the investment of time and energy and resources that the university and all the team here does every year. Um, I guess the big lesson I learned um, is, you know, there's an old saying, money is the mother's milk of politics. I think it was Tip O'Neill who said that, but I couldn't, I might be wrong on that. Um, and really two cycles in a row, but even we saw the threads of it in three. Um, I'm starting to wonder if that's still true. Uh, money's important, obviously, but 
Um, there was a lot of talk of a blue wave, which we, which we can debate whether that actually showed up. But there was a green wave, and um, uh, 5.2 billion is what we spent in the last midterm elections, which is a lot. Put in perspective, in the same time period, we spent $800 million on costumes for animals for Halloween as a country. But still, 5.2 billion is 35 is is um, is 35% uh, higher than the midterms in 14, which was three three a little over three billion. Um, and uh, the Democratic Party had the majority of the money, um, yet their night wasn't as good as you would predict if you, you took those same percentages 10 years ago and said, let's, let's put this money disparity. You had 90 challengers out raise incumbents, um, D versus R, and um, the results were kind of a mixed bag. Um, and I think that this kind of speaks to some of the early, earlier panelists talking about constant engagement, daily engagement. Um, you know, we always talk every year about the declining impact of TV, yet the number one spend on politics this year was TV. Um, and um, we talk about the mobile voter and other stuff and how we find voters. Um, I don't think politics lacks for money. I almost think um, people talk about Trump nationalized the election or in 14 it was Obamacare nationalized the election. I think when you look at Barbara Comstock's district, when you pump in $15 million into 700,000 voters, that have half of them who aren't going to vote, you have a tendency to nationalize the election. <laughs> I mean, when you pump 110 million into North Carolina, um, you do nationalize these elections. But, um, you know, Trump was an atypical candidate. He raised very little money compared to Hillary Clinton. Um, um, and yet he won. Um, and that's, you know, for many reasons. Um, and I saw our candidates get outspent race after race after race. And they hung in there. And I don't know, um, and, and, and I'll, the focus is on the House and my numbers, but even the Senate and, and, and even some of our governor's races. And it's a credit to the Democrats that they've, for 15 years, 20 years, have developed a small dollar donor base. I mean, their billionaires helped out a lot, too. I mean, two people gave $200 million. But um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a stagnation <laughs> on the Republican side that now everyone's saying, we've got to counteract blue. I think Act Blue is 10 years old, and we've, you know, Todd could probably confirm that the, the party's been talking about small dollar online fundraising for, for 15 years, but they haven't made serious investments into it. But um, that said, um, I almost wonder as um, we do have almost daily engagement on politics, the, 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 um, the trends are towards more money, but I, I wonder if, if what we're doing is really just turning these, these I would, I'd be fascinated, and I have no way to prove this, but I have, I have always had this feeling that um, when races hit a certain amount of spending, they just become base elections. And, and that's what I think, you know, you could argue that we saw a lot of, uh, except suburbs. Okay, so now that we've gotten that off our, off our collective chest, I want this to be a, a conversation. Talk over each other, argue with each other, disagree, <laughs> agree. Um, just no physicality. Um, and I, I want to throw out this, this uh, next question. Joel, correct me if I'm wrong. When all the votes are counted and we figure out who's won in all the races in California, this will be the largest Democratic majority in the House in 74, right? Uh, I believe that's correct. I don't, I, Stephanie, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Um, Wait, say that again? The largest win. The largest win. Pickups. Yeah, yeah pickups. Pick yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Well, regardless, how does um, maybe Speaker elect Pelosi, assuming she um, is voted by her caucus to be the next speaker, how does she keep, keep her caucus together? When you look at uh, my paper, you look at the other Jonathan's paper, there's all this talk about the base of the party wants the president to be impeached and investigated while other folks in the party want to focus on, on issues. How does the next leader, next speaker of the House, next leader of the Democratic caucus govern while also tending to the passions of the base? Joel or Stephanie start and then... Everyone jump in. Look, I've always believed <laughs> that you... Republicans <laughs> laugh. <laughs> Look, I, I've always believed that you win elections from the middle and that you have to win independent voters and you have to win moderate voters. Neither party, nor do liberals or conservatives, have the plurality 
uh, when it comes to ideology most of the time. Sometimes conservatives outpace moderates, but it's pretty close. And I think when you look at what happened, if you compare 2010, for example, when Republicans were taking over after the first two years of Obama, and what happened here is Democrats had significant gains among both independent voters and moderate voters. And I think if, as liberal as Nancy Pelosi is, I think there's an opportunity here for the Democratic majority in the House to leverage their power if they stay unified. If they get divided, they're gonna just be the focal point of obstruction um, with a president who can you know, use his megaphone every day fairly effectively and a Republican majority in the House. So I think you have to be realistic going in from day one about what did we win, what did we not win, and how do we now leverage the power that we have to get to some middle ground wins on issues where we know the public is with us. Um, and they are with us on things like health care. They are with us on issues like guns. Um, they are with us on issues like tax cuts that don't help working people. Um, and I think if they play their hand right and focus on the issues they can win on um, and leverage that power to get deals done with the Senate, that'll be a more effective means of uh, governing and of being able to maintain your majority than becoming a source of, uh, uh, you know, even if it's two equal parties become the source of gridlock, I don't think that's going to benefit anybody uh, in Congress for the next two years. Well, did you want to jump in, Stephanie? Well, I would also say that for, for the, um, the freshmen that are coming to Congress, they did not win on impeachment. So she has to pay attention to that. And Nancy Pelosi, I think she's also made clear since the election, there will be plenty of investigations uh, as a means of checks and balances in government um, to root out corruption and uh, make sure we're doing the people's business and uh, there's no self-profiting um, in pre uh, President Trump's cab cabinet, in, white in his White House, President Trump himself. Uh, but that doesn't mean impeachment. The other argument she has uh, and she's using is we, we need to see what Robert Mueller does uh, before we do anything. And that is the most powerful argument she has to hold people off. So number one, that's not why people got elected. They didn't get elected on impeachment. Number two, there is an investigation going on where we need to see the results. Number three, there's plenty of territory to cover <laughs> and build and do some investigating as part of their, doing their job. It's not, all, you know, as Joel said, they have to do, uh, they have to legislate um, based on what's go going to improve people's lives, whether that's raising the minimum wage, infrastructure. She's made it clear she wants to protect um, the ban on discrimination of pre-existing conditions. She wants to restore voting rights. All of those things matter greatly um, to people in the districts that won. Um, but that doesn't mean there won't be some checks and balances. Um, as my paper on the editorial page today said, to echo your point, Stephanie, that the President's administration is a quote target rich environment when it comes to um, potential investigations. But uh, Chairman Steele and um, Rob and Todd, one thing I, I thought about as Joel was speaking took me back to the president's press conference the day after after the midterms. And the number one thought I, thought I had the moment he started talking, <clears throat> excuse me, was that he, the president, was go was already starting to use the Democrats as a foil to hammer them before they can even get into and officially be in the leadership to make them the focal point of whatever problems might come in terms of, of getting a deal. Is that what we're going to see from President Trump for the next two years, no matter what, no matter what the Democrats come up with? Todd's already nodding. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is easy. It, yeah, President Trump is, uh, you know, depending on your vantage point, either at his absolute best or absolute worst when he has um, uh, uh, a, an enemy to, to run against or someone to, to point fingers at. It's how he is able to galvanize um, the, the Trump base. I, I, think, I think one of the biggest challenges it, Nancy Pelosi is about to find out how difficult it is to govern in the age of, of Trump, which is something that Republicans have been wrestling with over the last two years. And one of the challenges, I think, is that there are several competing uh, 
goals and competing conversations that are all happening simultaneously. You've got everything that Pelosi has said over the last uh, week or so, and she's been saying all of the right things. But for her to do what she wants to do, she is going to be uh, at odds with every Democrat in the Senate who is running for president, uh, and they are going to be at odds with every Democrat who is not a member of Congress who is running for president, because they will all have uh, very, they will have, they have competing interests, uh, competing goals, and, um, uh, and they can't all win. And so, you know, the Democrats, I think, in the House will have to decide, um, should our posture vis-a-vis -vis Trump be to challenge him on ethics and scandal, or should it be to challenge him on policy? Um, you could make a good argument uh, for either one, but, but in reality, I think that, uh, uh, you, then the easy answer is, well, let's do both. It's just not. I was going to ask, well, can't, can't you walk and chew gum yeah. at the same time? Isn't that actually have, a have necessity? Have you been to Washington? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Maybe no, a little too walk long. And, yeah, walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah, typically, yeah, right. they don't even have any gum to chew. So that's, oh. that's part of the problem. Now, I, I, I'd look at um, the Nancy Pelosi uh, situation, I think, a little bit differently than um, a lot of Republicans do, and, and maybe even some Democrats. Uh, I don't uh, underestimate Nancy Pelosi. Um, I know her pedigree very well. She's a Baltimore girl, and, and her, her, she comes from a very um, politically adept family, and she has, and this relates to a conversation I had recently with Steny Hoyer, she has a skill set that a lot of folks tend to undermine, uh, you know, uh, Underestimate? Underestimate, that's the word, thank you. Uh, underestimate uh, in many respects. I remember uh, dancing with Nancy on the health care issue in the 2010 cycle. And remember, we, we had a whole bus, <laughs> you know, fire Pelosi, um, which was actually fair, fairly successful. But, but the truth of it was um, she was able to, to pull through that legislation um, when it seemingly the, the White House had, had sort of weakened in its resolve, the, the Democratic caucus was all over the map, um, and she pulled that win uh, together in many respects. And I think um, in terms of how Trump, to your point, Todd, about you know, sort of governing in the age of Trump, um, I, my estimation, Donald Trump likes this scenario much better than he would with a Republican House. He doesn't pretty much like Republicans, um, in my estimation, um, and and that's and that's not a slight. That's just a fact. The man has very little tie and roots to the Republican Party, let alone conservative movement. So let's be honest about who we're talking about. Um, so he doesn't really care who's sitting opposite him, and we've already seen him willing to engage with Nancy and Chuck. Um, and, and he will use those opportunities both as a foil and an opportunity to advance some things. Nancy can sweeten his pot very easily by throwing together a very nice infrastructure bill that the president wants. That's, at the end of the day, that more than anything else, more than tax cuts, more than health care, is what Trump wanted from day one. The internal battle was uh, with Reince and, and Ryan wanting to push health care. Uh, Trump's instincts were, let's play and go with what I know, with what I do. I build things. I can get out and talk to the country about building things. And Nancy, if she's smart, and she is a pretty smart uh, poll and, and, and player, uh, will play to that instinct um, and make it, I think, uh, a, a more of a challenge for Republicans in the House uh, who are, will be in the minority and Republicans in the Senate looking back at their states with 22 heads on the chopping block in 2020 um, to engage a little bit differently. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how this narrative plays. So I don't underestimate Nancy Pelosi at all. Uh, she will be the next Speaker of the House, number one. I've said it for over a year. And number two, she will, um, she will work this system in a way where she will bring advantage uh, to her team much more than I think she's going to be given credit for. Can I, I just want to jump in very quickly because I agree entirely with what Michael said. 
Nancy Pelosi's best card to play is pass legislation yep. that the American people right. want, that a majority of them support, and hand it off to the and Senate. push it back to them. Put it on Mitch McConnell's desk, and it, let's see whether they want to act and do things that are in the American public's interest or not. Infrastructure is a great example. They refused to go above $800 million in 2009 during the financial crisis. Let's see how big they're willing to go now, because we know we need a hell of a lot well, more than $800 million. They spent $2 trillion, yeah. so what's another if, $800 billion, if, right? if, to, the, to the point that I was making, it, I totally agree. That is her best card, and it is absolutely... Uh, against the interest of every single Senate Democrat who wants to run for president to give President Trump a single major accomplishment. So, Rob, actually, I'm glad you brought that up, Joel, because maybe is the conversation we should be having not about Nancy Pelosi, but about Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. Should all the focus be on him now in the next, in the next Congress? Um, no, because Pelosi becomes the face of the party until you have a nominee. Um, well, I'm just talking, I'm not even talking about democratic politics or even presidential politics. I'm talking about governing, which you know, people want to ha have happen in the next two years. Right, no, I, I'll get to McConnell. I'm just saying, with Pelosi the face of the party and, and of all the leadership, she has the highest name ID and the highest unfavorables. It's a tough place for the Democrats to start. And I think... I'm, I'm, bear with me for a second, I'll get to McConnell, but I think the Democrats, they have the smallest majority they've had compared to Republican majorities. This is, you know, you know 15 seats is kind of where we're used to operating. But, but I think if the Democrats bring back earmarks, they may be able to establish more of a, a command and control operation that the Republicans just haven't really had since 2006. Um, but. It's still a huge challenge for Pelosi to keep her caucus in alignment. And, you know, um, the agenda that Joel talks about, create, making things better for middle class folks, that's not really where her base is. Her base is, is I mean, of the, the districts with an average income of $100,000, the Democrats won all 18 of those seats. Of, of districts making 75,000 to 100,000, Republicans have 15, not, not final numbers yet, but 15 of those seats, and Democrats have 45 of those seats. So the, 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 the base that wants an investigation, the hatred of Trump base that funds the Democratic Party wants investigations, they, they, want, they want Trump. And where she needs to grow her majority are the, the, the rural, the, the exurbs, the people who say, as Joel said, I'm not doing better off on these tax cuts. I'm not doing better off on the economy than I was two years ago. So that creates a dynamic that how does she get an infrastructure bill? Because they're going to go for, they're going to tie it to education and environment, and that's just a non-starter and, and for the Senate. And so how do you kind of get there? But say that she does do some really smart economic uh, education, health care legislation, sends her to the Senate. McConnell, you have to look and say he's not only leader for the next two years, but possibly the next four years, because five seats is a high hurdle to jump over, and it looks like that's kind of if you take the Doug Jones seats, that's that's where you have to kind of go in a, in a conservative, not ideologically, but just conservative thinking as a Democrat strategist, that if Trump gets reelected, you have to get five seats, and um, and so that's the challenge you have to say is McConnell has a much longer time frame. Um, you know, Pelosi really has two years to, to kind of push, and then she goes into, the, you know, the whole house goes up for re-election in seats that were drawn during good Republican state legislative era. So, so those seats will want to snap back to kind of their, 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 base, their, their base vote. So I guess McConnell's view is keep working on the judges, keep working on the executive calendar, the, the, the administrative calendar. And he has uh, six, he, six or seven Senate uh, senators up in 2020, they're going to be very anxious, but um, none of them in, in really heavy-duty Clinton states that I can think of that, 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 that um, is going to be wanting to really adopt a real blue agenda. It's more of a purple agenda. And so if Trump and McConnell can paint Pelosi as out of touch, and, and this is where I get back to the investigations fuel that kind of, that, that you know, the House is too left, the House isn't working for you, I think <coughs> McConnell's does what every Senate leader does, is they just ignore 90% of the bills that get dropped <laughs> off their doorstep, and they take up what they want. I mean, McConnell's a, a deal cutter, even more so, I think, than Trump would be in some ways, because he, he would be the legislative workhorse that, 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 that Trump just doesn't, doesn't have that, that team. But um, I think it, uh, I don't think McConnell feels any pressure to 
move to the left, to be more of a more like we have to get more done. I, I think I think he sees a very tight Democratic majority with an unpopular speaker, not only in our own conference but in, with the American people and Democrats uh, would rather it not be Pelosi when they're polled nationally about her, according to Gallup. So you, so you have kind of a mix where I don't see McConnell saying I need to do anything. I, I'm just going to say the course and just you know cherry pick what I think is good for the, the Senate conference. Stephanie. Well, if I were running the DSCC, um, I would be very happy to hear those comments. <laughs> because what I think is going to happen, and Pelosi, you cannot underestimate Pelosi. She's not going to be passing a far left agenda. Minimum wage is not f far left. It is, that is a supermajority issue right now. Protecting pre existing conditions, supermajority issue. And we know that. Democrats ran on it in the last month of the campaign. So were Republicans after having voted against it. 50 some times. These are the kinds of issues that she's already put out there that we're going to see come across, and she can pass that, those issues pretty easily. She's not going to create big, complicated bills that can be, uh, you know, sort of Christmas trees of uh, far left issues. These are going to be pretty simple bills that she's going to put over in the Senate, which may, McConnell may not feel pressure to pass right of way, but these are bills that will, will go to the Senate and die. And we, Democrats had a very bad Senate map um, in 2018, where we were defending um, lots of uh, seats in uh, red states that Trump won. That map gets flipped in 2020, where Republicans are defending seats in, in purple states. Um, and and yeah. yeah, purple, I, I, I guess I wouldn't call Maine a blue state <laughs> anymore. Uh, but. Uh, that is a much more favorable map to us. And normally you would say, well, Trump's on the ballot. Um, it's a presidential year. It'll be easier for them to get out their base. I don't think those rules apply anymore. We just saw record turnout. Uh, Democrats have a hard time turning out their base or creating new coalitions <laughs> in midterm elections. Not this time. We saw record turnout. I think as long as Trump is on the ballot, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see record turnout. Granted, not just for Democrats, Republicans had record turnout too, um, but the, the rule that we've always lived by in a presidential year, the president's base turns out at a higher level, doesn't apply. So you've got a couple of things working against these Republican senators who are up in 2020. Number one, a really bad map. Number two, uh, pieces of legislation coming over the House that will die in the Senate because it will be very difficult to pass anything in the Senate. Um, of very super majority type issues like minimum wage, pre existing conditions. Um, and for a Republican running for re election, you know, or for a Senate, a, a Democrat who wants to challenge those Republicans, you've got a ready made campaign from the beginning. So it, I think it's, it, it's an interesting dynamic. Mitch McConnell <laughs> is going to be thinking about how these guys get reelected. They're going to have to deal with the immigration issue. Uh, many of the senators that are up for reelection in 2020 are hating this caravan bullshit, excuse my language, uh, that Trump's Whoa, still talking you know, about so it. offended. I mean, Cory Gardner is already going to Mitch McConnell to say, uh, you know, we got to get off this. It's going to hurt my reelection chances. There's going to be more of that with Donald Trump. So that's the other factor. How do you control Donald Trump as he's thinking about his reelection and what does he do to these guys that are up for your reelection in purple states? Um, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Don. I just, I, I think... Um, I'm remembering back to when Republicans took control and there was all kinds of talk about how there were, um, there were all these issues where there were uh, solid majorities in terms of support and uh, a really simple one, two, three process to get this stuff passed and signed into law. Nobody told the Freedom Caucus about <laughs> right. any of those things, uh, and, and none of it happened. And, and, and from, no from where I'm sitting, I think the, where the enthusiasm and the energy is uh, on the progressive left, they're going to make the Freedom Caucus look like Henry Clay. <laughs> that there is, it, there is just no way that people are not going to be looking to pull out for their, their own advantage, um, how to pour as much gasoline on the burn it down fire as possible. Uh, and, and you don't, you're not able to call attention to yourself or, or your message by um, singing kumbaya songs about 
um, super majorities, the, the reality is um, that elections are won and lost based on contrasts. Todd, the only problem with that theory that you've, you've espoused a couple of times today is that largely through the Democratic primaries, the more left-wing candidates lost in their primaries, and the people who got elected are more centrist Democrats than the uber left by and large in terms of the 36 seats we won. Well, Stacey Abrams and, and Andrew Gillum were, <laughs> were, were your... But remember, we didn't have problems. Who was a centrist? Wait, I'm sorry. Stacey Abrams and Andrew Gillum are, are both middle of the Democratic Party, and they're running for governor. Absolutely. Remember, the, okay. uh, the, the, the Tea Party wasn't a problem until uh, 2010. So the point being is they ran candidates in eight, and um, uh, they weren't an identified movement. But I mean, we started having conservative problems, and it took a couple of years for them to gain the momentum. So I, I do echo Todd. And, Listen, the D-Trip went in on a number of races and put their thumb on the scale, which is their right to do. Um, and uh, so let's not pretend there isn't um, some movement left that, 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 that the strategists are uncomfortable with in general elections. Um, but, um, um, Joel, are you, well, as a I just don't think this is rooted in fact. Stephanie, I think, I think you guys are rooted, uh, the, you're basing your arguments in rhetoric and you can go look at every analysis that's been written on the election among Democrats. We did not elect most of the people who won in these seats. The majority are not far left candidates. But you had over 50 candidates that they wouldn't yeah, vote for I, and, Nancy Pelosi. And, what's that? Right, that means that they're not far left. I mean, the, most of those people who are not voting for Nancy Pelosi are moderates because they think she's too liberal. So it's not to say that Democrats don't have their own right. inner party issues to deal with. We do, absolutely. But I think if you look at who's coming to Congress, it is not a group of far left in individuals. Right. They're moderates who ran on mainstream issues and appropriate for their districts. And you guys did a really effective job making Stacey Abrams and Andrew Gillum look like they're the far left, but they actually did not run on far left platforms. Well, I, I don't know um, how to. But, uh, but that's, that's not my point. <laughs> I just wanted to correct that. Um, my point is, we don't know how this is going to turn out, right? We we're sitting here predicting it. The, the, they haven't even elected a new speaker. I just would not underestimate Nancy Pelosi, who has been dealing with this inter-party warfare for, more, for a long time. It's been going on since Obama was elected in 2008. Yet she very effectively uh, passed the Affordable Care Act by keeping the far left at bay and uh, figuring out how to sweeten the pot to get their votes, but she got it effectively through the House, which was a major feat. Um, it, it, there's a number of things that she's been able uh, to do like that. She, she was a major factor in passing financial reform and TARP um, and keeping the far left at bay at that. So I just wouldn't underestimate her ability to keep that caucus united. Um, and I think the bigger question is not what's happening with Nancy Pelosi, because I think she's going to be very effective getting um, an agenda through that uh, reflects what Joel's been talking about, things that matter to people back home, not feel good, reflexive, shoot at the hip political things, but real legislation that, that makes a difference. And it's, that's what these people were elected on, so she's going to make sure that they're able to make good on that. I do think that in the Senate, putting aside what we just talked about, what will happen with Mitch McConnell and Republicans, that you do have a number of Democrats running for president out of the Senate. Uh, and thwarting, getting, having anything getting to Trump's desk, making sure that there is a party divide in terms of what Democrats are fighting for versus what Republicans are blocking or setting up the argument in that way. That's where I think the party uh, divide is going to occur, not so much in the House. In the Senate, we've got to figure out how you keep the Senate caucus together as people are running for president in a way that either figures out how to uh, not be painted as obstructionists. Um, uh, Michael, before you jump in, I just want to say um, after uh, Chairman Steele makes his, his comments, or open it up to questions and answers, because uh, we have about 20 minutes, less than 20 minutes left in this session. Mike. No, I'll, I'll be very quick. The, uh, I appreciate what, uh, what was just said, but I, I think we also have to be, Democrats have to be realistic about their truth. Their truth is 
you've got a Bernie Sanders wing that a lot of Democratic candidates have adopted and have run on. Uh, Mr. Gillum in Florida was talking about free education, free health care, um, same as, as uh, the Democratic candidate in the state of Maryland, one of the most liberal states in the country, got his clock cleaned in a very liberal state running against a centrist uh, Republican um, on the same agenda. And so reconciling that is going to be a real challenge for Democrats, um, whether you're talking at the federal level, the state level, reconciling that that the inner workings of what that agenda is going to be when you're talking about a Medicare for all health care system and free education to every kid in a, a particular state. In Florida, what I think happened in the end, aside from racial undertones <coughs> that came into play, was a lot of voters woke up and said, wait a minute, okay, so what happens on Wednesday morning? How do you pay for all of this in a state with no income tax? And Gillum's campaign's response was, well, we're gonna raise the corporate tax. And the states of Texas, Louisiana, and Georgia will like, do that. Um, so there's certain, there's certain truths that are also gonna have to be addressed on a policy level uh, as are articulated by certain candidates within the Democratic Party. The same dance we went through on the right. I remember sitting in a room with Tea Party as they began to emerge in April of 2009. Um, and listening to what, what that agenda was all about and having to try to reconcile that in the elections we had that, that year in Virginia and New Jersey, let alone what we had to come up against in 2010. So, you know, the party's gonna have to come to, to some honest grip with what do you do with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and those who are pushing a very strong progressive uh, agenda uh, in the face of these supposed centrist candidates who, in many cases, espouse parts of that agenda, if not the whole agenda. All right, with that, uh, open it up to questions. I don't know, do we have handheld mics or just stand up and speak loudly? Oh, we do, great. Um, anybody, oh, Lynn, Jonathan, Kiki, let's start with Kiki. <laughs> and I'm gonna go for a twofer. Uh, first, Todd, will you um, talk just a little bit, if you could, about the trend you talked about in your opening statement, 25% in 94 versus 75% local versus national. Is that something that grew over time or did it flip because with this administration? And then if Rob and Stephanie, both of, both of your practices have strong digital and visual medium communications, can you talk to what Rob discussed in terms of the bulk of television is still there driving it my experience was voters used to have a rest between elections, right, with the media before they came back. No rest with social media now, right? My cousin in Louisiana getting the Antifa memes constantly. Can you talk a little bit about, is there a rest anymore? Is there no rest? And how does that change the broadcast dynamics? It, so, it, sorry, it, sorry to hog, but. It, it, uh, it, answer quickly. It, it is a trend that, it, if you look at it, it's a kind of a linear line that, that has gone up. Um, and it really does, um, it, I've never done this, but you could probably overlay uh, that trend line with um, sort of the role that cable news plays in, in the national conversation and, and they, would, they would mirror each other. Rob, Stephanie. So the question is whether or not there's a rest in the digital media space between, I think it depends what you're using the mediums for. And there is no rest from using a digital medium. Um, how many people here got emails election night from Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren and the other 30 people running for president <laughs> on the Democratic side? Um, there, you know, so it, it depends on how you're using the medium. Um, you know, Beto very effectively used digital to drive his message, did very little TV, a lot on digital. Um, homemade videos, uh, you know, that just elude, just uh, allow you to have an authentic voice. Um, on TV, uh, even though the bulk of the money is spent there, it'll be in an interesting study uh, that I haven't seen yet, and we probably won't see for another month or so, about the eff efficacy of those TV ads in the end, because there were so many. There was so much money spent on both sides, uh, particularly uh, Democrats, but when you account for all of the independent expenditures and the third-party groups, 
um, it was endless, endless on TV. And how effective is that um, in the end? Um, but in digital, where you can be much more customized and targeted um, and uh, regulated in terms of who you're speaking to with what message on what platforms and mediums and how often, um, is uh, you can really measure that effectiveness in a much more granular way. Um, so that, that will be always on. It's going to be used for different purposes. It's not all going to be campaign-oriented messaging um, be, uh, between now and when 2020 really kicks into gear, which is a matter of... Next week? Right. Kiki, I think you actually snuck in three questions. So <laughs> because, that's why she goes first. Uh, that's why she gets to go first. Um, first question, uh, I think digital spend, I think part of the TV spending is, it's a little bit of a, there was so much money in these elections that why not buy seven ads during uh, Redskins Cowboys on broadcast TV because you can. Why not, you know, why not buy New York City TV for New Jersey house seats because you can. I mean, there's so much money. With regards to digital, I think um, it, there's still work to be done, but um, the, the constant, you know, gamesmen and one-upmanship on the technology side with regards to Republican and Democratic um, operatives is, um, at least on the Republican side, the digital has gained ground the last four years and they finally, they still can't go toe to toe with the TV firms, but they're st they, they do have a place in, in the world. Obviously, I mean, Todd and I were joking about it earlier, um, you know, the, just the Republican Party alone is a $2 billion a year operation with no HR department, and where we feel it the most is candidates and digital. Is, is, you know, those are the two places we struggle the most trying to find people. Um, and then with regards to do people get a break, Trump is awesome for business, so why would TV, cable, anyone give you a break? Because, I mean, uh, W loses the House, and we oh, we sit in the White House, and we say we got to thump in, and we have a down week. Obama did the same thing, you know, and Trump just comes out the next day and does a press conference, fires the AG. You're kind of like says I mean, he won. I mean, the Democrats didn't even get a chance to enjoy winning the House. I mean, he just pounded right. I mean, is, I mean, the what the way he can shift the narrative so fast. Um, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I know sometimes even as a Republican, I'm winded by the constant, did you see this? I get from clients, <laughs> colleagues, friends, and I'm like, <laughs> what happened now? Like, I, don't, like I'm, I, I, I was on a call for half an hour. <laughs> What's the latest, you know? So do people get a break? Uh, no, uh, and I kind of, I think Joel talked about the, the constant engagement. Um, the question is, do they want a break? Um, I don't know, but when they do turn off uh, the show, it'll be forever. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, when, when the numbers dip on whether it's if Trump gets reelected or not, I don't know. But um, I think I think he's captured uh, the nation's attention in a way that I've never seen before. Um, and I just don't know if it lasts. I have no idea. So one thing I did just, that I wanted to add quickly, uh, quickly. Um, this is maybe one of the other lessons from this cycle. In a way that I have never seen in any other uh, campaign cycle, the minute the general election started, both sides put their jerseys on. And what, what we saw in uh, campaigns all across the country was the minute you went negative on your opponent, and you look at, at the polling, you were able to get their unfavorables to go up, uh, and maybe their favorables would take a dip, but there was almost no change in the ballot, uh, meaning that it, voters who knew absolutely nothing about who, whoever the Republican or Democrat candidate was, they were telling pollsters, well, I'm voting for fill in the blank because that person is a Republican and so am I, or that person is a Democrat. And so, you know, we would spend tens of millions of dollars just trashing uh, opponents, and they were spending it trashing us. And, you know, there were margin of error changes in the data. All right, we've got two questions on the floor in eight minutes. So, Lynn and then Jonathan Martin. Speed round. Last. Quick questions, quick answers. Right. So, um, as a 
I thought, you know, November 7th really began the campaign for 2020, and Stephanie reminds me it actually started November 6th as the uh, messages went out. So assuming Trump is the Republican candidate, I uh, just wanted to get some of the views of um, what you think the Democratic strategy might be or would be preferable to have uh, a field of thousands of flowers blooming in the Democratic garden from which to choose a candidate, or whether there will be at least an attempt to coalesce around one or two main figures early on. I don't know whose strong hand makes that happen. And then, secondly, without, you could mention candidates, of course, if you've got ones, but I'm more interested in what you think of in terms of a skill set, trait, um, the, you know, who, the contrast we talked about. So who's the anti-Trump or the contrast to Trump in terms of this temperament, approach, skill set? Well, I guess I'll go first. Because Joel, Joel's staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> we just go a little Joel out of it. <laughs> Uh, will Democrats try to call the field? Um, that worked w really well last time um, with, between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Did nothing but fuel Bernie Sanders. Um, I don't think, even if we had the strong hand to do it, you could do it um, without it completely backfiring. Um, I think that this will be a process and a messy one. Um, and there's lots of people who will say, well, this is great for democracy and um, and we should be having this debate, and uh, it's a tribute that all of the, we have such a deep bench of people that want to run. Uh, there are also those that say, <laughs> uh-oh, this is going to be uh, really messy. Um, even just thinking about how you uh, create a debate structure that is effective uh, with all of these candidates. Um, earlier this morning, we were going through everybody who has mentioned something about running, and it's, it's over 30 people. Not all of them are viable, but it's over 30 people. So how do you create a debate structure where all of them get their, <laughs> you know, unless you have like an eight-hour debate, you, they'll get 30 seconds each. Um, and eventually you're going to have to call that down. And how do you do that in a way that, it look, that it's a democratic process, small d democratic process, um, uh, and not infuriating different um, uh, elements of our party? Um, what was the second part? Oh, what does what the uh, ideal candidate look like? I, I don't have the slightest idea, to be honest. And I don't think you can paint a picture of who that is. Uh, you know, you don't know who's going to catch fire. You don't know, um, you know, the Democrats fall in love, Republicans fall in line. Um, uh, we don't know who that is yet. You know, there's, there's metrics that you can look at now who has name recognition and fundraising and certainly Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris they all have name Cory Booker Joe Biden um, they have name recognition they're showing up on the polls um, but that at this point doesn't mean anything we have to see how this goes um, you know I'm never a believe in, believer in running the last race particularly it's the last race that you just lost um, so, and, but I'm also not a believer that, um, that we need to answer to everything that Donald Trump is. Um, we need somebody who speaks to, to the American people, gives them a different way of running this country. Um, you know, it, not the antithesis to Trump, but a, uh, a, a, an optimistic look of where leadership can take us. And I'm also not an espouser of, you need a, you need a, you know, um, a person of color, you need a woman, or you need a white man. There's lots of debate going on right now. I, it, it doesn't matter. You just need the person. I don't care what they look like, what their gender is, or where they come from. You need someone who ha can articulate uh, a better message for this country and pull people together around that message. John, real quickly, and then Jonathan. Yeah, I'll go very quickly. Um, one, I think, no matter how large the laundry list of names is right now, um, money will be the first ballot cast, and a lot of people are going to fall by the wayside before they ever get close to Iowa and campaigning there. Um, so you, you still may wind up with a crowded field, not <laughs> unlike what the Republicans had in uh, the beginning of the last presidential campaign. I don't think it'll be quite so sprawling. Um, the second thing, I agree there's no s certain profile, but I think there'll be two things that the country's hungry for. I think the country is sick of divisiveness. I think it's sick of hyperpartisanship. I think part of the appeal 
um, that Barack Obama had in 2008 um, was an ability to talk across lines. I think the person is going to have to be a progressive leaning Democrat, but people forget that in a lot of our primaries, we have open primaries, and you win those primaries with appealing to independent voters who can vote in those primaries. We have more open primaries, I think, um, than we used to have. So I think the lane that someone is gonna have to occupy is gonna be a person who can convince people they can get things done and credibly make a case that they can be an antidote to the kind of toxic politics we have in Washington now. Jonathan Martin, really the New York Times. Uh, right there. Uh, really fast because we're closing down here. Um, but if I could have each of the folks up there tell me which race this cycle your side lost that alarms you the most going forward? That way. Fabulous oh. question. Which, which race you guys lost the cycle which alarms mm -hmm. you the most going forward? We'll start down at this end, Rob. He said down the line. I started that end. So. I'm last on all these questions. <laughs> Me the most, um, and it happened so recently. I haven't dug in, but South Dakota. I don't know why that was so close. She's a good candidate. Um, she's she was. Yeah, but you won there though. Yeah. I know, but I don't know why it was so tight. Like what happened in South Dakota? The Dems had a great can. What? The Dems had a great candidate. <laughs> so do you just want to answer your own? Question? Just answer, your own <laughs> answer for you if you want. Uh, <laughs> that alarms me the most. I would say. Uh, you know, the, the suburb losses, pick your race. And the Which house, one? That, 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 <laughs> you want me to say Brad. I know you want me to say Brad. I'm not going to say Brad. You want me to say Brad. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> he just said Brad. <laughs> Minnesota race. Um, uh, Paulson. 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 You know, places like that where, um, you know, those, we made great inroads in the last four or five years in the suburbs. And, uh, it scares me if we start to get pushed out of the suburbs. Stephanie Cutter. Do you have an opinion, Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> I do, actually. Ohio go. Well, we haven't technically lost this yet, um, but uh, Nelson. Um, you know, I think there's Bill a lot. Bill Nelson in Florida. Bill Nelson in Florida. Um, I think it's a, it's concerning that Democrats can't win statewide in Florida. Florida is the ultimate battleground state. Um, for Democrats, we win and lose presidencies there. Um, and, um, and again, we haven't technically lost. There's a possibility we could win. Um, but the fact that this is even a question is a big problem for us. We, ha we ha have not been able to figure out how to organize on the ground in Florida. The, the Democratic makeup of that state has changed dramatically. Um, it is much more diverse, but it is not a typical acting uh, coalition for Democrats. Joel Benenson? Yeah, I was going to say Nelson also, even though it's not gone yet. I thought, I thought that was um, a race that we would win. What was the second part of your question? Okay, yeah. Um, for some of the same reasons as Stephanie, um, and I also thought there was absolutely no path to the majority if both Nelson and Menendez didn't win, and mm -hmm. we won with Menendez in New Jersey. She had a great poll for people. Nelson? <laughs> Nelson did? No, did he? Menendez. Menendez. Oh, I'll check him out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, Menendez is an example of what Todd talked about. You can spend $40 million. We constantly saw our unfavorables went up. We, re we saw the lead go below double digits once. Michael uh, Steele. I, I have a twofer, um, it, and it's one is a win and one is a loss because I, as, as a county chairman and national chairman and state chairman, um, my focus has always been on not just where you lose but where um, where other the other team is winning and how they're winning. So the loss would be Paulson because uh, it represents a, a brand of the Republican Party that's on the bubble right now. Uh, in this age of Trump. And so if you're looking to hold the ground in those suburbs and exurbs, and even you'll find the Paulson type candidate exists in the city, in the inner cities. You just have to go in and call them out and have that message uh, uh, take hold. If you don't do that work, there's, there's no game there. There's just no more game. But for me, um, the win uh, is Texas. A lot of Republicans are whistling past that graveyard, and they're not paying attention to what the Democrats have been doing on the ground in Texas for over 10 years. 
Uh, and, and I've been saying it since I was a state chairman 12, 15 years ago, uh, to pay attention to, to ground games in places like Texas where your opponent is laying down some seed bed. Um, a lot of folks in the Democratic Party ridiculed uh, Howard Dean and his strategy, but that strategy is taking root, folks, and it is bearing fruit. Um, now, I like to think I modeled my chairmanship after Howard Dean, as Howard Dean <laughs> would say, yeah, we both did well with that. But, um, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is you've got to play in your opponent's backyard in a way that is in your face, up front, ground game, organization, infrastructure, and investing in candidates that you know will lose because they become the, the offspring of those who will win in the future. I mean, they sort of, that seedbed. So Texas for me is a big red fl uh, flag because two cycles from now, we lose Texas. We lose Texas. Two in, cycles, in, okay. Yeah, yeah, two cycles, <laughs> two cycles. Okay. Joel, I, I, oh, sorry, Todd, no, go ahead, sorry. It, it, I would say that if, if you wanna know what the limits of um, Trumpism are, uh, like what happens when you push it past the breaking point, it would be the Kansas governor's race. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. that, that is, there, there is no reason why Republicans should not be winning the Kansas governor's race and yet we lost and lost handily. Um, uh, and so I, it, I'm not surprised by it. Um, nor am I particularly alarmed given the specific circumstances, but there is a lesson there that if it is not learned in 2020, uh, uh, I think it will be repeated. All right, I think we are, we are out of time because we, we have to go to our break and reset for the next panel. Thank you all very, very much.